Hello Anna, hello world. I'm Cheryl and I'm going to read some notes that I've made about my thoughts and feelings about the situation we find ourselves in now, early August, with the Covid situation. So here goes. Um, my husband and I are artists and we run a small gallery in a small town and we have a reputation to develop and to keep. We absolutely acknowledge and respect the varied viewpoints that each person has and have no wish to bring conflict to an already difficult situation. But a viewpoint is one thing, the truth is another. We evolved with a strong instinct for survival, to stay safe, and that is essential and it goes without saying. And suddenly we are all under threat, according to our media and our governments. The question one must ask is, who, before this Covid event, gave such credence to government and press? Who really believed that there was integrity, honour, freedom from bias and corruption in our media, in our governments? One has to ask then whether we had already been primed through slow years of biased and fear-based reporting, not to speak of education and other social uh, institutions, to react with unthinking fear to what we have now been presented with. Is it possible that our brains are now more physiologically tuned to knee-jerk fear than to rational, clear thinking and independent thought? Thinking that life should be without difficulty, without pain, without fear, is surely quite shallow. Is it down to the spiritual vacuum left by the decline of the church that we have come to believe that we must at all costs avoid suffering, pain, loss. And by the way, I believe that our church has utterly failed us. It locked the damned doors to what could and should have been sanctuaries and places of guidance and help in a time of real crisis. I will not forget that. So, do we have anything to fear? Yes, possibly. But what are we to do? power in unthinking obedience to overreaching bureaucrats. Life by, by its very nature is full of risk. There will always be illness, infection, viruses to contend with. And the idea that we must keep ourselves safe until COVID-19 has been eradicated once and for all, or, God forbid, a vaccine is fast-tracked for our consumption, is stupid beyond belief. Who in their right mind believes that a world teeming with bacteria and viruses and which our immunologists tell us are essential for health can suddenly be made safe and sterile? I don't want a sterile world. I want to play in the dirt and eat coal and lick my sticky fingers and run down the sand dunes in the rain. Don't take away the exhilaration that comes when we think we're lost and we almost don't want to go home because there are adventures to be had in the woods, mysteries to be revealed that cannot happen in our safe houses. We are born adventurers, not cowards. Well, of course we don't wish pain or loss on others. We do not wish it upon ourselves. I've had some pretty grim times as an asthmatic, suffering with pleurisy and some severe chest infections. And my greatest pain has been to see my mother die unexpectedly, in pain and far too young. That hurts, and I would do anything to reverse time and bring her back and have her live her life without pain, without suffering. But I can't, and in the middle of this pain I do see meaning. Through my own grief and the strength I have found in it, I may be able one day to help another in their grief to bring to them some strength and meaning. I found my own wisdom and maturity in my loss. Would I have found it otherwise? And meaning is, I think, what has gone missing in our lives. Meaning, how do you survive without meaning? A world, a life without meaning is, is just a nihilistic vacuum of horror, 
where life itself is regarded merely as a random event, where we see ourselves as a collection of cells walking a meaningless path towards an inevitable death, the void. I wonder did Dawkins and his band of merry atheists contribute a little to this desolate view? I've come to realise that life itself brings its own unforeseen meaning. It's a meaning you can't manufacture. You have to allow life itself to present it to you, a gift sometimes wrapped in dirty newspaper, sometimes wrapped in exquisite tissue, shot through with gold thread. Through my own experience, I've found that my own fear has lessened as I have tried to accept that life's vicissitudes actually have a reason not that I have liked it, and not that I have condoned the bad things, of course I haven't. But I would have remained a child without them, and so I'm grateful for the pain and the problems. I can accept that that is how life is, black and white. Without the polar opposites of light and dark, no growth is possible. Maybe this is what love your enemies means. Not condoning, but nevertheless accepting that that is the nature of life. Light and dark, radical acceptance of a very difficult reality, but a reality nevertheless. Some poo-poo the notion that there is a God, or even that the world is inherently good. But just look at life, the human body, and see the miracles that abound in our makeup. Positive qualities like kindness, love and compassion have actual physical effects that bring an upward trajectory of healing and health and joy. I discovered recently that performing, receiving and amazingly just observing an act of kindness can measurably boost our immune system. Cultivating thoughts of appreciation and gratitude can enlarge the electromagnetic field which emanates from our heart, and this can be measured. This field has been shown to positively affect those standing within it. Social distancing, no thank you. How many people are now saying, bugger it, and just reaching for each other for a hug? Physical closeness is just as, if not more, important for our health as food and water. Studies have shown that a small percentage of people meditating at one time can positively affect crime rates in a city. The act of smiling somehow makes the facial muscles stimulate the production of feel-good chemicals. By the way, I remember from my O-level studies that one of the Spanish words for smile is sonrisa, which looks awfully like sunrise to me that life-giving, healing sun. We only have to sit for a moment and gaze at the world and challenge ourselves not to be moved by the wonder of nature, by the fact that honey and tea tree and marigolds can fast-track the healing of cuts and infections, and that garlic, with at least the allicin inside it, and cumin and zinc and quinine can strengthen our incredible inner systems. If we die having the fundamental joys of life suppressed in the name of keeping us all alive, then we will have lived, will we have lived at all? Or will we have merely existed, missing not only the variegated and crazy joys of human interaction and creativity, but also the opportunity to deepen, to grow in wisdom, not to speak of our ability to find inventions, new ideas, solutions that we never had to search for before. Necessity is the mother of invention, they say, but if necessity, as we are being told, is only to survive because we're being told we are too bloody weak to find our own way, then our God-given brains will find themselves not inventing but atrophying into a shameful mess. And here is the thing, we are all lovers. Is that not enough to convince us that life has meaning and purpose? We love our spouses, we love our children, and our love gives them strength and health and the ability to live a good life and affect others. We love our, our art, we love music, 
literature and animals and architecture and bridle paths crowded with cow parsley and skies blue as speedwell and translucent shells on damp sand and playing poo sticks with our children and listening to Gregorian chant which by the way has been shown to boost the immune system on listening and stamping our feet at the proms on a summer evening in London and treading the streets of cities and searching for good cafes and bars, galleries and museums all those things that give life joy and meaning and love. <laughs> we cannot allow ourselves to be robbed of our faith in ourselves, our intelligent bodies and marvellously designed immune systems, our unbelievable ability to find strength and solutions to support each other in ways that are less tangible than literal medicine but which are powerful beyond words. I would rather die young knowing that I have lived a rich and loving life than die heartbroken that I have allowed my God-given autonomy to be hijacked. Hijacked whether by those with a corrupt agenda or whether by a foolish and inept but well-meaning government that is claiming to keep us safe whilst all the while playing a cynical and diabolical tri trick upon the populace. But not all of us have been brainwashed, and I think it is our responsibility to speak of our conclusions, uh, to express our passion and our sorrow at seeing so many of our brothers and sisters being so royally bamboozled. Here is part of a quotation from an article by Dr J Lee, who's an NHS consultant that I read yesterday, I think in the Telegraph. Quote, grounded in dubious science, and cowardly politics, the grievous wounds we have inflicted upon ourselves with the lockdown are becoming more evident every day and alarm is spreading among doctors at the continued mothballing of sectors of the NHS." End of quote. I supported the NHS at the beginning because I knew from a very bad experience back in January just how hard pushed staff are watching as A&E staff struggle to care for people in crowded corridors, yes, having sat with my 87-year-old father for 10 hours in reception, awaiting attention. I now believe that a reassessment, or a rethink, at least is in order. By the way, my family was fortunate enough to be able to care for my father, who became ill just after lockdown started, but not everyone was so fortunate. And so I speak on behalf of the families who have been kept away from their elderly parents, who have been living and dying alone. I speak on behalf of those whose operations and procedures have been delayed and who now face an early death. I speak on behalf of the children I saw yesterday outside my gallery, all under 11 and wearing masks in varying fashionable fabrics. This breaks my heart. The psychological and maybe physical damage this may cause to those children and others is beyond criminal. I speak on behalf of parents who are noting their toddlers and babies becoming unhappy and destabilised. I heard today that some friends of my father have lost their son. He was probably in his late 40s or early 50s a beautiful dark-haired young man that I met years ago when my parents lived in Belgium. His funeral is in Brussels this week and because of Covid restrictions his parents are not able to attend his funeral. My heart is aching for them and as I write is beating hard in sheer fury. The suggestion that we must avoid catching a virus by doing these dehumanising things is abhorrent and I think literally diabolical. I protest this undermining of our God-given intelligence, health, wisdom and humanity with my whole soul. I reiterate, we are all lovers. The Sufi poet Hafiz says it best, quote, love sometimes wants to do us a great favour 
hold us upside down and shake all the nonsense out. Perhaps this is what the Covid situation is all about when all is said and done. Let's shake all the nonsense out. Thank you.